All right, I guess we should get started with, can you hear me? Is this on? Oh, okay, thank you. Because <laughs> it's, it's, it's green up here. <laughs> well, that'll be a different They set meeting. the volume down. They keep setting the volume down, Rosie. Okay. How is this? Nothing? Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah. Testing, testing. No. Um, hello, hello. Test. Well, we could move. We could move down. No. Oh, let me get lost. Okay. Hello? Did, can you hear me? It's the volume. It's the volume. Um, there is no... Let's see if Councilman tried more. I'm pushing. <laughs> we were trapped by a machine. I'm sorry. Okay. Actually, say something. See if that, I thought I, no. Okay, try it now. Um, hello? Hello? You, okay, okay, great. And let me, um, Bill, let me try you, let's try you as a test. Let's. Bill, would, would you? testing. Great. Good Thank to go. You. Thank you. Okay. The, you had this button here was it? the mute all button was on. It was. They had jiggled with it before. It wasn't on originally. All right. Thank you, everybody, um, for being here Monday, June fifth, the Budget and Finance Committee meeting. We have, I uh, believe, uh, forty-one items. Um, so we will get um, started. Um, and before we start, I want to just flag a little bit of committee biz business going forward. Um, if we can uh, be uh, ready to go. CIB amendments. Uh, Brandon, I know, sent out to everybody uh, another uh, issuance of the CIB by district. Please look at that and file your amendments, the CIB amendments package will be circulated on June the 12th, and then on the 13th, we will have a called committee meeting, and then there will be an adjourned council meeting to pass the CIB on June the 13th. But submit by tomorrow. But submit by tomorrow. So uh, your amendments can go in the CIB package. Um, there will be another Budget and Finance Committee meeting uh, this Thursday, June 8th at 4 o'clock. Uh, this is uh, a session, a work session focused on questions that have come up from past sessions. Uh, we expect from codes to have Mr. Herbert and Mr. Cobb to confirm what budget changes are the most effective for codes during Nashville's time of growth and what fee increases would be necessary to pay for those changes. Uh, from hospital, Judith Peak Lee uh, to answer questions and what would any increase to general's funding uh, provide for from MTA, Mr. Bland, on how MTA funding increases will increase ridership. And then we missed Matt Wilshire with an incentive section um, during the regular budget hearing, but hopefully he can be there and have a, a, a the makeup session for the segment that was missed during the regular budget hearings. Also, state trial courts, district attorney's office, property assessor's office, and the beer board all are providing answers to questions that were raised in the last meeting. And then for your calendar on June the 15th, there will also be a Budget and Finance Committee work session 
and that will include a discussion of sources. Now that being said, uh, again, a lot of items on the agenda today. We'll go on to bills on public hearing um, tomorrow night. There are no land use bills on public hearing, but there is the operating budget on public hearing. So that's bill number BL 2017-722, approves the budget ordinance for the metropolitan government for the fiscal year 2018. Is there a motion? Motion and seconded, any discussion? There will, I know, be plenty of discussion going forward. Seeing no one in the queue, all in favor of 722, please say aye. Aye. aye 722 is recommended by the council. Another bill on public hearing is, now Councilman Glover, did you want to speak on 3736? For clarification on 722, will they come back to this committee again or by us? Uh, I, I, help me refer, uh, refresh well, my memory. I think it does, does it not? To, it can be re-referred back. Okay, to do we need to do that? Do we need to do that now? It's already on your schedule. It, it, it is already on your schedule to be heard. It, already on the schedule to be heard by this. Committee. Okay, all right, very good. Thank you. Thank That's you, Chair. Good. Okay. And then Councilman Mendez. I just want to confirm that 722 and 736 are both amendable on third reading. Yes. Thanks. Yes. And thank you, Councilman. And then moving on to 736, we have a proposed substitute in front of you. So um, shall we, is there a motion on the proposed substitute to 736, which is adopting the 2017, 2018 through 2022, 2023 capital improvements budget for the metropolitan government of fiscal year 2017, 2018. So a uh, motion and a second. Um, and um, so for discussion on the substitute of 736. Thank you, Councilman Glover. Just for, I want a clarification again, Mr. Jamison, that in fact uh, it can be amended. So, so the amendments we're putting in right now that are due tomorrow will actually be, uh, be uh, amended on third reading, correct? Correct, you'll get the packet of amendments on Monday the 12th and this will come back before the council on the 13th for presumably third and final reading before the 15th deadline. Okay. So June the 13th is, is, will be CIB day All right. here for the committee and then for the council. Thank you, Chair. All right, thank you. Um, seeing no one else in the queue, all in favor of the substitute, please say aye. Aye. Substitute. Well, it says substitute. That for 680. Okay. All right. So uh, there may not be, uh, well, we will be seeing a substitute on June the 12th. So, all right. Amendments. We are voting on the, um, CIB to be amended by this committee and the council in the meeting on the 12th and the 13th. Right. Right. Vote to right. Let's, let's, if you don't mind, let's have a motion to vote on the CIB to be amended on the 12th and the 13th. Second. Second. All right. All in favor of uh, 736, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, 736 is recommended to the council. Now on to resolutions. Uh, resolution RS 2017-682 establishes the certified tax rate in the general services district and declares the amount of the certified rate for the urban services district. Is there a motion? Motion made and seconded. Uh, any, this, seeing no one in the queue. As a substitute. Oh. To track. oh, okay, I'm sorry. Here it is, we have a, a clerical uh, clarification. There is a proposed substitute, which is in your amendments package, for 682. Substituted and then deferred to try. And so the, we, we need to adopt the substitute and then uh, defer this to track with the operating budget. So uh, is Councilman Mendez. So we, want, we need a motion to adopt the substitute and uh, and defer until June 20th? Yes. So moved. Uh, motion made and seconded. Um, seeing no one else in the queue, uh, Councilman Mendez's motion to substitute and defer until the second meeting in June, or the, actually it'll be the third meeting in June, the June 20th meeting. Uh, everyone, 
Everyone, please say aye. Please say no if you disagree. <laughs> 682 is re recommended to the committee and its deferral. All right, resolution number RS 2017-685 approves the Metro Animal Care and Control Fee Schedule. Is there a motion? Uh, uh, and this also should be deferred to track with the operating budget. So your motion to def is there a motion to defer? Motion to defer, motion to defer seconded. Uh, Councilman Glover. The, as I was reading through the analysis, um, I, I realized what they're anticipating the increase in revenue is. Are, are they basing that on just historicals? And by just purely raising the fees, that, that we'll see the additional 158. So no pie in the sky here. And we have an expert in the back. Thank you. Uh, yes, the calculations were based on what are the number of licenses that we processed uh, the past few, few years. So the 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 uh, cost that you see is based on per transaction cost for this new system that allows us to process these things electronically instead of the old ways of uh, processing it by paper. Yeah. But the number is based on historical uh, figures. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Chair. Yeah. Thank you, Councilman. Seeing no one else in the queue, all in favor of 685, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, 685 is recommended to the Council. To defer. To defer. Is recommended to, to defer to the June 20th meeting by the Council. Resolution RS 2017-713 uh, issues general obligation bonds to the Metropolitan Government in the amount not to exceed $288 million. Um, and and track with the CIB. And this historically is def deferred to track with the CIB. Which would be June 13th. Would be June, June 13th. Um, one second. Uh, well, his, historically, it is deferred uh, from this meeting. Um, is there a motion and a second? And Councilman Mendez. So uh, the motion is to defer until June 13. Well, the, I guess there's a, there's a motion to defer. I don't know that the council has agreed to when it should be deferred to. Well, I'm making a motion to defer to June, June 13. 13. Okay. And then I have a, a question. Um, question uh, is, so when would amendments to this resolution be due to Mr. Jameson? So if those could be submitted by, I know we've asked for the CIB amendments by tomorrow, and I think we've gotten them from most everyone. If it's possible to submit them in by tomorrow as well, that's a personal request. If it's the will of the chair and the body, that would be the request. All right. Thanks. All right. Council Lady Allen. I just want to get a little bit of clarification. We can probably talk about this more at the June 13th meeting. Are the resolutions that we have passed in the past authorizing bond issues, have all of those been issued? And so at this point, we have no resolution hanging out there authorizing us to issue general bonds? I think that's a Talia question, and I can't see you for the computer. Are you asking if we have any other GO initial resolutions pending before this body? Yes. No. Okay, so at this point, the only way we have to spend money is commercial paper, and this will enable us to issue commercial paper having this bond no, issue. This, this, this resolution will authorize us to move forward with these capital projects, which will be funded initially with commercial paper. And we can't do that until we pass until this. Until you pass this. Okay, thank you. Council lady. Councilman Glover. I'd like to rephrase the question a little bit. Are there outstanding general obligation bonds that we've passed over the last couple of years that have not been issued, that we've not taken to market yet? You're talking about old projects that have not been bonded that, yet. Yeah, that, yes. well, let me, let me, okay, so let's, let's, let's get to the point of where, where I really want to go with this. So a couple of years ago, and if everybody will stick with me for just a second, a couple of years ago, we rushed and we, we passed the capital spending plan 
at the same time with capital improvement budget, but this is when the jail was going on and we made some mistakes in that and we didn't catch it. And so therefore some money, because things were left in the CIB that were not in the capital spending plan, some money was spent elsewhere. Do, Mr. Chair, is there a reason that this has to be passed for the capital spending? I, I know the CIB has to be passed, but is there a reason that we can't be a, a bit more intentional and look at this a, a bit more thoroughly on the capital spending plan to make sure that we don't make mistakes that cost the city 25, 27, 52 million dollars? Well, I, I def thank you, Councilman. I defer to Council, but I believe there's nothing in the charter that requires the CSP to be passed by any particular date. As a practical matter, just for a quick review, the CIB, as you know, required by the charter to pass it by the 15th. Historically, the CSP, which is a relatively new instrument, I think introduced either by the Bredesen or Purcell administrations, historically that has tracked the CIB, but the deadline for passage is not set forth within the charter or code. The only caveat I'd, I'd, I would add to that is my understanding of this particular CSP was catered to address those issues for which we have imminent closing dates, imminent contract dates. In other words, these are projects, if I understand finance correctly, for which there's a reason to approve sooner rather than later. So can, can we find out what those are? I would defer to finance on that. Okay. Right. And, and the reason is, is because I would like to defer this particular resolution to the second meeting in July. That way we've got time to thoroughly go through this, understand it, uh, because, I mean, Chair, I think you were telling me there's uh, about a billion dollars in unfinished projects out there. We're, we're getting ready to add another $288 million to an already substantial amount of money that the city owes. And so I would like for us to be intentional, make sure that we, we, we dot our I's and cross our T's here. Okay. So that, that's a question for, for finance, Talia? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm following the question. Please the question. State the qu I mean, there was a lot in there. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> so, so the question is, what, what in this particular capital spending plan has to be done? Um, I mean, because we've got a lot of things that haven't been done that we passed over the last couple of years. What has to be done contractually? An example, uh, uh, and I think this is one that we had last year uh, was Hillsboro. Okay. So that project uh, is ongoing. They're in the middle of, um, of uh, they have contracts in place and they, we want that project to move forward. Uh, there is also a commitment around the uh, ice rink uh, that we have a contractual obligation. And I think, I, I, what is that July 15th? 15th uh, for that property where we, after that date, if we have not closed, that there are potential pen penalties. Mm -hmm. So the actual cost of that project could increase if, um, if this capital spending plan uh, does not move forward. And when does the, uh, well, I, I assume since you mentioned Hillsborough, mm -hmm. we're talking about Hillwood now, if, if, if what we have to deal with now? No, that's a separate, that's a separate project. Okay. We're talking about, that had to do with... Uh, but it has a closing date. Hillwood has a closing date as well, but Hillsboro, What's the closing date on that? Yeah. Uh, the s August 1, August 1. So then realistically, and if we take the ice rink piece of it out. Well, the thing that you have to remember is that after you all approve a capital spending plan, there's a requirement to post that spending plan um, in the paper or a public, uh, to do a public notice of that before spending can begin. So, and that's a John. Is am I right? It's a thirty day. It's a thirty day requirement. Okay. So, Mr. Jamison, let me ask you. Um, I'm having to dig back for a while here, and there may be some other council members that have a uh, relatively good memory on history. I think that we, it, it, over the last several years, it shifted that we were trying to pass the capital spending plan at the same time the CIB was passing. But years prior to that, it actually was passed in the fall. Uh, that I remember. Is it, is it, am I remembering that correctly? That is correct. In September, the, the first time I passed one was in September. Okay, so we're not going back that far. So is there a way to pull out the, what's contractually has to be done in this capital spending plan, make an amendment for that to be done, and then move, remove the rest and hold it until the second meeting in July? Is that, is that possible to do? Yes, technically the amendment would be to delete those items from the capital spending plan. Well, but 
But your request is if this is being deferred to June the 13th on the meeting on the 13th to have the list of the projects that have some emergency to them as opposed to the projects that have, have less time sensitivity. Right. I think, I, and I, and sorry I wasn't explaining it correctly. I, I just don't want us to rush in if we can avoid it. And I don't think we have, there's, you know, there's nothing on fire here, I don't believe. There's a couple of contractual pieces okay. that need to be dealt with. But outside of that, I don't see the reason that we have to rush in, in, into this. So that, but but uh, that's your request, Councilman, yes. then, is that finance provide that list of time sensitive CSP requests to and us when we when we bring the on the 13th and so if it's come and so mr. Jameson I'll ask the question to you if I may so if it comes back to us on June the 13th and we've got those timelines of what we have to deal with uh, it, it's a it's amendable I think you said at that time so at that point I guess we can talk uh, mr. chair you you and mr. Jameson chair can talk about how we do that particular amendment but but I think I think for uh, the sake of making sure that we're doing our job thoroughly, that we need to we need to investigate that. What I what I would recommend, just so that this is administered smoothly and with as much transparency as pos possible, I would ask finance now to have the list to you of those items that are deemed of any urgency in this CSP okay. by by Friday the ninth. And then if we have that in time, we can go ahead and pre-prepare the amendment that would delete the non-urgent items from this CSP for the council's consideration on the 13th. Okay. And, and then have a separate CSP for then those items to be considered at a later time. At a subsequent date. Okay. All right. Well, then, I, then I'll, I'll stick with the June 13th then and withdraw my deferral to the second meeting in July mm -hmm. and request that list by this coming Friday. Okay. And then... Uh, uh, back to our finance director, Talia, do you, uh, is that a con schedule that works for your department? Uh, we we will work with the departments to be responsive to your inquiry, but uh, I want to go on the record and say that everything in this capital spending plan is needed. Everything needs to uh, move forward at this time. We brought forward a very small capital spending plan. Um, and we had a deliberate approach in terms of reviewing all of the requests. There were many things that were not funded in this capital spending plan. So we were thoughtful and looking at the things that we felt were important to move the city forward. And those are the projects that are recommended for this body to consider. And I would encourage you to uh, move forward with the entire plan because I think it's an appropriate thing to do. And let me just say, if I may, that we have a bunch of sidewalks that were paid for out of a, a police headquarters that was supposed to be built because we didn't dot our I's and cross our T's two years ago. So I think it's important that, we, that this body does our job thoroughly. So I would still request that we have that information by Friday. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you, Talia. Uh, Council Lady Allen. Thank you. If I can have a second go around on this. Can, um, can I get someone on that table to sort of explain the difference between um, I mean, one of the things we learned at the Treasurer's report was that you can have a project that is funded, but then there may you may have a bond issue for some of that funded uh, amount, but you may issue bond money for it two years down the road to finish the project up. And so, I mean, I guess what we learned is that there are projects that are technically have been funded or have been put in the list of things to be funded, but we may not necessarily have sold the bonds yet for every bit of that whole project, and that this 288 million is designated for specific things, which may again be just part one of a project that's funded, and two years down the line, we would sell more bonds for the tail end of that. Is that is that correct? Yes, you've got a good understanding of that. I don't. I think you've done well. Thank you. Y'all explained it well. <laughs> so, and I guess I think the question that that, that uh, Council Member Glover is asking is. Um, how much of previously funded things is hanging out there that would not be addressed by this 288? I mean, maybe that's information that might be helpful to have at the June 13th meeting as well, if I can make that request. And it, that, and it may just be a repeat of information that you gave us as part of the treasurer's report. I think it is, uh, and in terms of what has been approved and what's moving forward, all of that information is available in those quarterly financial reports okay. that we have provided the Metro Council. Okay. 
So we may just need to pull that out and look at. It. And then this, the second question that I just want to make sure I understand is, if we if we broke this 288 million into two pieces, one of which is um, uh, critical time-wise and one of which isn't, and we had, quote, two capital spending plans or an amended one or whatever, how, how does that fit in with the general, I mean, the, the actual process of issuing bonds or posting the notice? Does that add expense to the project down the line in one way or another? Or to the, it, it to the bond could, issue process? It could potentially, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Um, Council Lady Wiener. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate it. I've got a couple more questions, again, moving down the same path. Um, so, yes, the Ice Rink and the Hope Park property are both uh, time sensitive in terms of contractual deadlines, and I would obviously request that they be left alone because of the need for the 30-day notice and in order to um, not negatively impact other people, innocents, that are involved in this. So that would be thing number one. Thing number two, um, Talia, you and I had spoken at length about trying to put into some workable format starting after this budget process for the future, um, working into some specific step-by-step, -step, this is how it's going to happen in the future, delaying the capital spending plan so it's not on top, or not all of it, on top of the CIB and on top of the operating budget, because that was our goal, was to decrease that, that bunching, if you will. And so my question is, how would our moving forward with that plan and the ordinance that's written to fix this moving forward, um, if we were to um, implement that now, can you speak to a little bit about how those two things might differ and how that process moving forward will be a lot more seamless and maybe we need to look at the next year plan and why it's better to look at the next year plan than it is to run and and change everything at the last hour. Okay. And I know that was rambling, but I, I think you get what I'm talking okay. about. I, I do, and I've appreciated those conversations uh, with you uh, very much. And uh, uh, the planning uh, department, Doug Sloan and his team have also been involved in that discussion, so I just want to make sure that everyone understand that this has been a collective effort uh, to look at that process. I think uh, f in terms of this capital spending plan and moving these forward, because we do think that these projects need to move forward, that we could probably implement some of those recommendations that we've been talking about, maybe for the second capital spending plan, because we um, did talk about uh, incorporating some uh, additional meetings additional review processes. Uh, I think uh, you specifically had in mind some ideals around um, additional scoring and metrics that could be put into place. Um, so I do think that we could um, follow up that conversation and entertain that for the second round that hopefully we'll be able to do later this year. Yeah, so for the record, that ordinance will come on the heels of this budget session so that we have the opportunity and the time to plan mm -hmm. and put things in place well ahead. Mm -hmm. um, so my next question would be relative to that, um, what are the unintended consequences to other projects that we have not previously discussed? Um, any ongoing building projects that would have to come to a halt? if we delay the capital spending plan and the issuance of the bonds? Yeah, we can give you a more complete list, but um, another example might be the um, uh, Century Farms project that's listed there in the capital spending plan that could potentially impact the IKEA um, relocation and timeline. I don't know how that would uh, fit into the schedule in terms of the timing on the funding, but there are all of these things where you kind of, kind of like a balloon, you poke here and something else comes out. So it's really important to be really thoughtful before you just say these can wait. So when you provide this list to us on Friday, could you be pretty specific? Because I don't want to go to head, go headlong into something um, insofar as possible, you know, give us an idea of, of what, and I'll just call them unintended consequences, yeah. we'll for just lack give of a you better a, term. We'll give you a short blur. We can't write a thesis, but we right. will give you some information to, uh, so you can make an informed decision. Right. Um, and make sure I understand this correctly. I think this is right. We can actually do a capital spending plan anytime during the year. Yes. Thank you.
Thank you, Council Lady. Uh, Council Lady Vercher. Thank you, Chair. I thought you wasn't going to get to me. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, great discussion. You know, I'm just straight and to the point. My question is, how do we t determine what's non-urgent? Like, how do we, how do we decide the priority of projects if this is what we're going to try to do? Um, piggybacking off of some of Council Lady Weiner's questions, um, the unintended consequences. Um, I, I don't want us as a body to, to begin starting to pit projects over projects, pitting communities over communities. Some of you know that's some of the discussions I'm having now uh, with Metro Schools as it relates to how they prioritize um, capital projects. Um, so I don't want our budget to become um, that type of tool where it actually divides this body as opposed to uniting us under common themes for the betterment of the city. That's what they elected us here to do. So I just go back to what determines a, a non-urgent project. How would we say that the ICE Center uh, is, is more urgent than uh, the, f the future IKEA project or something in Councilman Glover's project? We all are here to be good stewards um, of, of this budget. Um, we just need to make sure in, in certain asks that um, um, we're not open up and opening up an opportunity for something that we can't foresee or, or make matters worse. And that's, that's basically my question, Chair. Um, well, Council Lady, I think you posed a deep and uh, profound question, as always. Um, I, I, I don't have any answers, but that's a great question. Uh, and I think it's one we should all listen to. Any any further questions, Council Lee? Uh, I'd like to oh. I'd like to comment Please. on that. Um, in terms of uh, the administration, first of all, one of the things that we do try to look at is to make sure that any recommendation is balanced, that you uh, are looking at needs across the entire city uh, in terms of uh, you know what do we need for our schools, what do we need for our roads, what do we need for our parks. Uh, so we look for balance in there because we're never going to have enough money to do everything. Uh, we look for um, areas where there is perhaps life safety issues. Those are always at the top of our, of our list. We look for projects that have been in the queue, quite frankly, for um, a long time. You know, because some of those projects sometimes get forgotten and we want to make sure that we go in there and look at uh, projects uh, where you might have a council district that, uh, uh, that has not had needs in the area of parks addressed at all. You know, we look at master plans. We look at where master plans say there's needed work for various different types of activities. That could be sidewalks, it could be bikeways, it could... Um, it could be parks, it could be uh, infrastructure, it could be um, doing repairs in MAC Head Start centers. Uh, so uh, in terms of saying that there's one way to go in and prioritize, I don't think that that's possible. You have to just look at the overall needs of the city and try to balance what you can do um, with the resources that you have at the end of the day. Thank you, Director. Any any following question, Council Lady? Uh, Councilman Pridemore. Thank you, Chair. And I think I want to ride that pig some more. Um, <laughs> this these projects, no piggybacking. I just want to ride them. But, um, these projects have been put in place, and a lot depends on when the timing of the of the of the budget is being uh, will be approved. And I, I, the last thing I want to do is get into a uh, bickering with a fellow, with a colleague about which project is better or more needed in one other district than another when it takes sometimes you, anyone knows who uh, has attempted to get large projects funded, it takes years anyway. So I, to throw another cog in the process, I just... I don't see why this necessary. This has been, been working fairly well. There may have been a mishap from time to time, but normally it seems to be 
uh, performing well. The communities are all getting uh, the capital projects that they need and want for, the, for their community when available and when not. Also, the timing uh, of the bonding issue, there's a, there's a question of interest rate. Am I not, am I correct? Yes. I mean, we've got to know uh, what we're gonna need in advance in order to get the rate by the time, if we wanna stop a project or, or just did not allow this project to go when it's scheduled to go six months from now, and then all of a sudden we're gonna need more money with a higher interest rate. Uh, just throwing that out there. So that's going to create, um, uh, cause the city to spend more money. And if this, talking about rushing into the into this, uh, why we don't need to rush, well, this is actually rushing in, is creating a problem for our capital projects. Why not during the year, if there are some questions about wanting to review what are uh, what are, are soon to be funded and what are not? Why can't that be done during the year? Why does it have to be done immediately right now during the during the, the middle of the budget process? If it can be uh, it can be reviewed any time during the year. Why does it have to be now when it will affect so many projects? We start uh, start changing the, the the funding process now. There's going to be someone's going to lose. Some projects are gonna lose and higher interest rates on the, on, the, on the issuing of the bonds. So I just think it's been working fairly well now. Yes, there's been some hiccups from time to time, but uh, it seems to be one of the, it's best we got and that pig's getting tired. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, thank you, Councilman. Uh, Council Lady Dowell. Forgot to press my button, it's been so long ago. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I think everything has been said. I, I don't know why we would move as far as delaying this uh, any further. Um, we've had numerous discussions about um, um, our plan. And I go back to what Council Lady Vircher says. How do we decide what's important and what's not? I will speak for my district. Uh, the items I have in there are very important. In fact, they're instrumental to our area. Um, and so I do not want them delayed. And, uh, and I don't want to go through the process of cherry picking things out and, and our council getting into a debate about uh, uh, what it should be prioritized and what should not. I think we should move this forward. It's the right thing to do. And I hope that uh, we'll all agree and go ahead and move this forward. I do, and I think uh, our, um, we just said this a few minutes ago, we have uh, some serious infrastructure improvements that need to happen. And those things are critical. Uh, if they do not move forward, we, we don't have uh, to June and September and so forth to wait on those things. In fact, we're already running behind. And so they are critical to the IKEA development and they're also critical to other uh, businesses that are planned, that are already approved, that are coming along that I-24 corridor. Those businesses generate taxes and we live in a very competitive environment you know, delaying this capital spending plan and delaying these infrastructure improvements can mean that they go choose to move their business to another county. So uh, we don't have the capacity to wait. I think we should move forward and, uh, and I just ask that you support it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Uh, Councilman Davis. Thank you, Chair. I don't want to pile on at the end, but I just want to say, uh, <clears throat> certainly appreciate and respect um, the couple projects that have an urgency just wasn't really understanding the other side where we need to delay other stuff. I guess I'd rather, I think it's just cleaner if we just move it forward altogether. Uh, it seems to be, uh, or at least in my experience, that's what we've done every year. Um, and so I'd, I'd support moving forward. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman. Um, Councilor Wiener, did you, or back? I, I'll just say one more quick thing. Um, I would like us to recognize that moving forward, we're gonna be deliberate in our plan and how we choose to address both the CIB and the capital spending plan in a very measured and um, deliberate way that would include setting criteria for how, how projects are, are identified. That's all. Thank you, Council Lady. And back to Councilman Glover. And I'll just close with this because I, I don't want animosity on the floor either. In fact, what I'd like to see us do is our job and be the legislative body. And so in doing that, that's why I'm asking the questions I'm asking. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, the taxpayers, a $25 million mistake, which ended up turning into a $52 million mistake on the police headquarters, I think that's substantial enough for us to, to find out what the timeline is that we need to look at here. Uh, and I'm not asking us to stop any projects. I think when we look at the timeline, to look at the capital spending plan, 
and to pass it in two separate forms or an additional spending plan down the road, I think it's okay. If we're, if we're not going to, I mean, if, if that's the way that we're gonna move uh, forward, then there's really no reason for us to have discussions. We'll just get whatever the mayor s s sends us and let's just pass it. And so, uh, you know, not saying that we wouldn't end up passing it anyway, but what I'm saying is I don't think it hurts us, nor does it hurt the taxpayers of Nashville for us to go through it and be deliberate. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Um, seeing no one, out, oh, Councilman Pridemore, last speaker. Thank you, Chair. The, I don't want to reiterate any, I, I don't want to repeat anything that was already said here, but I, I do want to say that there are, there, yes, that is our job, and I don't think that we have been uh, negligent in that job. So uh, to say that uh, we, a $52 million mistake was made because we were um, careless. I don't think there was a $52 million mistake made, uh, but some people have different versions of that. But I do say that uh, we don't rubber stamp anything. This, this uh, legislative body uh, hopefully thoroughly reviews all issues, all spending, and that's why we're here today. So I would say that uh, we are diligent in our duties and I, uh, uh, everything that has been uh, spent by this city, by us, it's come through us. It's come through the other legislative, uh, other budget and finance committee. So um, I think we've thoroughly discussed many capital projects and some of them have been good and some haven't, but yet w there has been many good, true discussion and I encourage discussion. There's nothing wrong with that, but I, I don't want rubber stamping either. So I think we, all of us agree that uh, the, process, the process that we're now involved in is, is a good, healthy process. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Council Lady Wiener. Oh, okay. All right. You were the last speaker in the queue, Councilman. Uh, the motion is to defer uh, 713 to the June 13th meeting with a request that finance, a separate request that finance provide a time-sensitive breakout of the CSP items. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed? We are deferred to the June 13th meeting. Uh, resolution RS 2017-714 approves a grant from the Tennessee Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services to state trial courts to provide adult and juvenile drug court programs to address the needs of nonviolent offenders. Is there a motion? Motion made and second. Seeing none in the queue, all in favor of 714, please say aye. aye. 714 is recommended to the committee. Resolution RS 2017-715, uh, Councilman O'Connell and Gilmore are the sponsors, approves an application for a Victim Services Coordinator's Grant from the State Office of Criminal Justice Programs to the Metro Office of Family Safety for funding of three victim coordinator positions to assist victims of domestic violence and sexual assault. Is there a motion? Motion made and seconded. Seeing no one in the queue, all in favor of 715, please say aye. 715 is recommended to the council. Resolution RS 2017-716, Council Lady Van Rees, the sponsor, authorizes the execution and delivery of an economic development incentive grant agreement between the Metropolitan Government and Music City Productions Incorporated. Um, is there a motion? Moved. Moved and seconded, and Council Lady Henderson is our first speaker. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was just going to inquire if we could get a little extra color and information on this, please. I'm looking at the um, the grant summary attached, um, but I don't know if that's Mr. Wilshire who would speak to that. Sure, uh, Councilwoman. Um, so this is the grant uh, agreement for Music City Productions, which is the production company for the TV show Nashville. Um, this covers the incentives both for season four and season five. Uh, this council has already approved these funds uh, in the budget for fiscal year 16 and fiscal year 17. Um, and so this is the grant uh, agreement just to document and then disperse those funds. Um, so there are performance requirements in all of the incentives that we do, and this uh, 
grant agreement is no different. The company uh, has now achieved those for season five. Obviously, season four is completed now. Um, and so we're just wrapping those up. And, uh, and these are the uh, agreements to paper that incentive. Okay. And, Did that and answer your question? I, I, I don't know if that was what your question was, but. Well, I just, I see here a million dollars was included in the operating budget ordinance for this purpose in financial year 17. The budget ordinance now under consideration by the council in FY18 includes 1.875 to pay for this new grant. So I guess I'm just yeah, a little that, confused from a wording perspective. What season are we in now? I must admit I don't. Yeah, watch. so my understanding is that the uh, that analysis is uh, incorrect includes a reference to some funds that are actually allocated for other items um, or actually hold on let me uh, previously. So th there are uh, in, carry forward incentives that are reflected in this year's budget th that you will be voting on. Th the incentives that are being allocated for season five and season four have been previously approved in the prior year budgets. Okay, uh, what season are we in now? So it is airing season five currently. It has aired essentially half of season five currently. It's CM, It's now airing on CMT, and so as opposed to a typical launch in the fall and then wrap up in sweeps in May, CMT is doing a little bit differently, but let me just simply say to you, season five is what they're airing right now. Okay, so they're currently working on season six, right? That would be in production presently? Season five is airing. They, they, they actually have not begun production on season six yet. Okay. They are wrapping up season five. They've aired half of the episode for seasons, half of the episodes for season five. They are contemplating whether it will be picked up for season six or not. Okay, I guess my confusion comes in. It just looks like we're disbursing incentives for seasons that have already been filmed and passed. We are. So, and why it, you, are we doing that? Because you voted on these a year ago and two years ago. You've already approved these agreements. But these why are, weren't they dispersed? Because there are performance requirements that the company has to meet before we can give them the money. They've now met those performance requirements, and so we're now going to disperse the funds. And what are those performance requirements? They have to air a certain number of episodes that are filmed primarily in Davidson County. They were slightly different for seasons four and seasons five, but they have to produce the episodes in Davidson County, shoot them in Davidson County, and then they have to be aired for season four on ABC and for season five on CMT. They have now met that threshold for season five. They had to air, I believe, I don't have it in front of me, I think it was 12 episodes on CMT mm -hmm. that were produced in Davidson County have to be aired on CMT. They've now met that threshold. And when did they meet the threshold for season four? Uh, they met the threshold for season four like a year ago. And why didn't we disperse this then? There were administrative delays on their side and on ours in getting the actual funds dispersed. And what were those administrative delays? So th they had to paper that the seasons or that the episodes that were aired were shot. They got them to us. Quite honestly, we were slow in putting the, the resolution before you guys. And so by the time we got the paperwork for them and we had processed it through, we figured we'd just roll seasons four and seasons five in together. Okay, so just to clarify, they didn't really need the incentive money to film season four? Yeah, so that's that's not, I don't, I don't think that's how I would characterize it. So you f uh, voted for, let me I pick one example, I don't know if you voted, but this body voted for the incentives for Bridgestone when Bridgestone decided to construct the headquarters downtown. They will in fact not receive those incentives, Bridgestone, for two years from now, three years from now. Um, Companies, when they make decisions about whether or not to move forward with projects, count on a variety of factors. I mean, similarly, the national TV show isn't receiving the advertising dollars that are aired on CMT until after the episodes actually air. So companies make decisions based upon projections. Included in CMT and Music City Productions' decision to move forward with the production and airing of Nashville TV show was a commitment that this body agreed to in approving 
the season four and season five incentives. The actual receipt of those funds comes far after the commitments made by the city and approved by the council. Okay, but I'm not sure if that, you know, the analogy with Bridgestone where you have kind of a, a more corporate relocation, gonna build a building, I think there's a certain understanding that those incentives might land later, but I think the community has a perception, rightly or wrongly, that those incentives are part of helping this show to be produced. So I guess it's somewhat surprising to me that, you know, incentives that were voted on for, you know, because from a TV show, frankly, from year to year to year, you don't know if you're going to get renewed. Right. So, and part of the kind of, you know, dialogue for providing these incentives is to help this show get renewed. Right. One hundred percent. That That is why this body. I mean, it, just a, re a reminder again, this body approved these incentives when you passed the fiscal 17 budget and the fiscal 16 budget. That was when you made the decision. Yes, we are committing to this uh, incentive. Uh, this is simply the papering of that. But it, I mean, I, I, so. You have made that decision as a body, I, appropriately so, I think. The, the, the return on investment for this city from the TV show Nashville has been tremendous. Uh, and, I, and so I think it was an appropriate investment in the continued production in Nashville and airing of the show. Um, and, and I mean, I, I heard you say that the analogy isn't comparable. I, I think that it is, I, I don't know, I mean, your Councilman Swope is actually in this business. He can probably talk more expertly than I about it. But, but my understanding is when they were making the decision about whether or not they were actually going to pick up the show at ABC, at CMT, whether Lionsgate was going to move forward with it, these incentives, both from the city and from the state, are absolutely factored into the decision about whether or not there's an expected return on their on their investment, uh, private sector investment. So, right. I, so, I think it's so the they say, but I mean, so, I think, so they say, right. right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. If 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 you, uh, it, yes, so they say. Okay, I appreciate your um, answering those questions. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, thank you, Councilman uh, Councilman Leonardo. Thank you, Chair, and uh, Council Lady Henderson asked quite a few of my questions already, but. Yes, sir. Uh, I guess when I'm looking at this resolution, I see I see one resolution on here. I see a, a prior ordinance and another prior ordinance. Uh, and this question is for Mr. Cooper, Mr. Jameson. Uh, if these things have already come through the Metro Council and they've already been approved, it seems like this would be an administrative procedure that when conditions precedent or antecedent are performed, that they would just request a check. So legally, why are we bringing a resolution to go after the last three years worth of money legally? Because when we actually disperse the funds through a grant, it has to come before the council for the actual disbursement. That's the simple requirement. So you can. And that's in addition to actually appropriating it under the other legislation. Correct. Okay. And is, is should they have done this earlier and made this request earlier? Or is this? No, they have. You approve a dispersal in the underlying budget, in the contract that allows the incentive. You set certain conditions precedent. You wait until they've checked those boxes off, and then when it's time to actually allocate the money, it has to come back before the council to issue that disbursement. All right, thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Council Lady Vircher. Uh, yes, uh, Council Lady Henderson also asked uh, several of my questions as well. I want to go back to the, the performance requirements. Um, one is where the, the show is actually aired. And um, it was mentioned about the return of investment. Do we know like how many jobs um, this is generating? Yes. For so, the record. Sure. So uh, season four aired on ABC, and season five is currently airing on Country Music Television (CMT). Um, and in terms of jobs. Um, I will defer to uh, Sam Reed, who I believe is in the audience, but my understanding is um, I, that there have been at least 400 people employed. That may include some of the small businesses as well, but Sam, I don't know if you have any additional cover, color that you want to provide on that. And if you can provide like tourist dollars too. Sure. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Sam Reed with the Inger Group, represent Ryman, who's a um, 
production partner on the show. So in terms of the jobs, uh, Council Lady Vir uh, Virtue, um, 200 full-time employees on the show every season. Uh, we also have uh, lots of extras every season. That's about uh, 800 in any given season. Uh, in terms of the amount of money that is spent here, um, it's about $45 million in the state of Tennessee and uh, 20 million is, is spent on local labor and about another 25 million of that is spent on local goods and services. And I, and I can reiterate, just in terms of some of the line of questioning, is that these incentives are absolutely vital for the show. The state of Tennessee is a very um, modest state when it comes to the film incentives that they offer. I mean, we compare this with states like Georgia, Louisiana, and our so uh, competition, so to speak. Uh, they would give a, quite a bit more money to have a show like this shot. I mean, uh, you know, I think the annual budget for the state of Georgia in, in film incentives is something like 250 million. Ours is about 10 to 15. Uh, and Nashville is one of three shows that the state incentivizes. And just by way of comparison, I mean, the, the city has, over the last couple seasons, has given uh, 1.7 million, uh, 1.75 million from uh, the city and the CBC uh, in season four. Uh, in season five, they gave two million, uh, with one million from the, the metro budget and one million from the CBC. The state, in those years, respectively, has given eight million dollars in season four and eight point five million dollars in season five. So it's putting these deals together that. I mean, we've, uh, they've come down to the wire as to whether or not the shows get picked up. These are absolutely vital, and 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 we are, I, I'd say we're 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 in the game here, and we're competitive, um, but we certainly are not giving what uh, what our neighboring states would give for something like this. Thank you. Uh, any further questions, Council Lady? Okay. Thank you, uh, Councilman Glover. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Wilshire. Uh, the 16 and 17 budget were not the first times that we had allocated money through the council for the show, correct? Uh, that is correct. We allocated uh, not for season one, but for seasons two and three, we had previously given incentives. And did we do the same thing where we had to come back and pass the resolution on the grant, or was, this, was the contract structured a little bit differently? It was exactly the same. Okay, so, so we're doing exactly what we've done in the past, yes. and we're following it through. And, and let me just emphasize, I think as far as investments are concerned, this is probably one of the best ones we can do. You know, I, I think uh, a lot of people downtown, especially this coming week, was or would argue that I don't know how many jobs we create, but I, I guarantee you uh, it's going to be packed downtown between the Predators and, and CMA Festival. I, I mean, so that show is definitely a big part of it. So thank you. I, thank you for the clarification. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilman Mendez. Uh, one comment, then the question. Uh, first, the, the comment is I, I really appreciate that the incentive money isn't paid until after there's a performance standard met. I think that's the right way to do it, and I'm glad you guys are doing it and making sure to check to, that the performance standard is met before giving out the money. Um, the, the question is, I think, back to where Council Lady uh, Henderson started, which is the write-up talks about fiscal 17 and 18, and it is confusing, I think. The way I was reading it is that the operating budget for 17 had a million dollars in it, and I'm, I'm gathering we didn't spend that and are not going to spend it in 17, and there's that million and another 875 for the next fiscal year in, in the next budget? I, I'm not going to speak to the analysis, but these agreements don't have anything to do with FY18. When the 18 budget passes, should you all leave that in the agreement, we will bring back another agreement for the fiscal year 18 budget. Isn't that correct? All right, then let me correct. turn. So, so th that'll be, you'll, you'll we'll receive a different resolution to approve that in agreement in 18. Then let me turn the question to Mr. Jameson. <laughs> does that sound right? It does, and I'll correct the analysis chart on the all right. online version. All right, thanks a lot, that helps. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, seeing no one else in the queue, uh, the motion having been made and seconded, uh, all in favor of this resolution, uh, 716, please say aye. aye. All opposed, 716 is recommended to the Council. Resolution RS 2017-717 adopts new play plans for the general employees of metropolitan government, excluding employees of the Board of Health, Board of Education, and the Police and Fire Departments. 
effective July 1, 2017 and July 1, 2018 and July 1, 2019, and establishes the salaries for the public defender, vice mayor, and members of the Metro Council effective upon the beginning of a new elective term of office. Council Lady Murphy is um, the sponsor. Is there a motion? Motion made and seconded. And uh, Councilman Mendez, is this, you were there, our first speaker. Just wanted to make sure, get clarity for the viewing audience. So um, this uh, uh, would raise the council sal annual salary starting with the next term. And uh, um, could you, Mr. Jameson, tell us what the current salary is and what the increase is going to be? Uh, current salaries, I believe, are 15000 annually for council members, 17000 for the vice mayor, and the pay plan would add roughly $7,000 to each so that it would get to twenty two and 25000 and change. That's not an exact figure, but that's... Uh, 23 one for the council? 23 one for the council. So. Um, and the uh, other um, significant benefit that council members get um, for... Uh, um, medical insurance after retirement um, that stays in place unchanged currently correct yes yeah and um am i am i remembering right that uh, the um, post being in office medical benefit that council members enjoy is uh, unique in metro i think that is unique in the country um and but you serve, serve two terms and then you receive a fairly generous medical benefits package and uh and that packages that uh, for the rest of our lives um, for in, uh, council members and their families, Metro pays 75% of the premium and we pay 25%? That is correct. Um, there have been, as, as I recall, don't quote me, I think there have been two attempts to uh, eliminate that and I, one was when I was um, on the floor and I believe the argument was that because of the relatively low pay the council members received, it was a necessary incentive uh, to serve. I think you could have a legitimate disagreement with that, but that was the argument made in previous attempts to overturn it. I, I wanna um, let my colleagues know and the viewing public that I'm gonna, uh, for the June 20th meeting, introduce a uh, ordinance that would um, change the post being in office insurance benefit um, for council members to match what um, the rest of Metro employees would be entitled to. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Council Lady Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. When um, we had a compensation study done last term and we talked about a potential increase in salary for the for the council and it was it was voted down at the time, partly because of the way that increase compared with what had happened relative to the rest of um, Metro employee rate raises. Um, is there is it possible for us to have information on how this increase compares percentage per year wise with what's happened to the rest of Metro employees since the last time the council got a raise? Does that make sense? So if it's been 10 years, is this a 1% a year or a 2% a year, or is it a 5% a year raise is my, is my question. And how does that compare over the same period with how a typical Metro employee has had their salaries increased? So I see Mr. Jamison writing that down, and someone will get me an answer before third reading. Is that correct? I think uh, HR. And okay, like HR. Mr. Great. Mr. Oh, here Mr. We Kennedy. Are. HR, right, right here, right. And Can he answer, answer it now? Can he answer right now. Awesome. Yes, that is comparable to what the other Metro employees have received. Because we can only adjust your salary uh, once during any term, and we it's been several years since, several terms since it's been adjusted, but that was the, the procedure we used. Okay, so that was how you actually calculated it. Yes. Great. Okay, thank you. That's great information. I appreciate it. Thank you, Council Lady. Um, seeing no one else in the queue, um, 717. We'd move to oh. defer to oh, track sorry. Oh, the budget, there we are. typically. Um, Councilman Mendez. I was going to ask, um, I think there was a motion to pass this, but to don't you want a motion to defer? To defer to track with the operating budget on June 20th. the 20th. So moved. So moved. Seconded. Uh, all in favor of deferring to track with the operating budget, please say aye. And this is deferred to June 20th. Uh, resolution 2017-718 um, adopts in new pay plans for the employees of the Metro Board of Health, effective July 1st, 2017, 
July 1st, 2018, and July 1st, 2019, Council Lady Murphy as the sponsor. Um, this also, I believe, should be deferred to track with the operating budget. Correct. Is there a motion to defer? Uh, motion made and seconded. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, 718 is deferred to Ju the June the 20th meeting. Resolution 2017-719 adopts new pay plans for employees for the Metro Departments of Police and Fire, effective July 1, 2017, July 1, 2018, and July 1, 2019. Council Lady Murphy and Pardue as the sponsors. This also, I believe, needs to be deferred to track with the budget. Is there a motion? Moved. Moved and seconded. Seeing no one in the queue, all in favor of deferring to the June 20th meeting, please say aye. 719 is deferred to the June 20th meeting. 2017-720, uh, Council Lady Murphy is the sponsor, provides longevity pay for employees for the metropolitan government, including employees of the Board of Health. Um, this also does not, this does not need to track with the budget. Um, is there a motion? Moved. Moved and seconded. Seeing no one in the queue, uh, Council Lady Murphy, the sponsor. <coughs> I'm sorry, I was I just was halfway paying attention since I'm not on this committee. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, are y'all not deferring this one? Apparently it does not need to be deferred to track with the budget. I'd like it to be deferred because the administration has not met with me yet. Okay. The council lady has a motion to defer how many meetings, Council Lady? She's not on the right. committee. So if someone so. will do that for me. All right. It will Council Lady Furcher. I guess it will Thank you, Chair. I move for deferral. Move for deferral, one, two. I guess to track with, I assume they'll move, I mean, I know that they have acknowledged they need to meet with me before the rest move, so I would appreciate, I guess, if they would track with the other ones. Move for deferral to track with the budget, Chair. Track with the budget. Uh, the motion made, the motion seconded. Um, thank you, Council Lady. Um, seeing no one else in the queue. All in favor of 720 to be deferred to track with the regular budget, please say aye. Opposed, 720 is deferred until the June 20th meeting. Uh, resolution 2017 721 approves the salary for the Chief Medical Director of the Metropolitan Government. Uh, Council Lady Gilmore is the sponsor. Um, is there a motion? Motion made and seconded. Seeing no one in the queue. Uh, all in favor of 721, please say aye. 721 is recommended to the Council. Resolution 2017 722 approves a grant from the State Department of Health to the Metro Board of Health for Family Planning Services. Um, is there a motion? Motion made and seconded. Seeing no one in the queue, all in favor of 722, please say aye. 722 is recommended to the council. Resolution 2017-723 approves a grant from the State Department of Health to the Metro Board of Health to achieve sustained tuberculosis control and enhanced tuberculosis prevention. Is there a motion? Moved and seconded, seeing no one in the queue. All in favor of 723, please say aye. 723 is recommended to the council. Resolution 2017-724 approves an intergovernmental agreement and, um, and amendments between the Metro Nashville Police Department and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers for extra duty police services. Councilman Pardue is the sponsor. Is there a motion? Motion made and seconded. Um, Seeing no one in the queue, all in favor of 724, please say aye. 724 is recommended to the council. Resolution 2017-725 approves an application for a grant from the State Department of Finance and Administration to the Metro Nashville Police Department to provide mental health services and criminal justice system advocacy to victims of violent crimes. Council Lady Gilmore is the sponsor. Is there a motion? Motion made and seconded. Seeing no one in the queue is uh, all in favor of 725, please say aye. 725 is recommended to the council. Resolution 2017-726 approves an amendment to a grant agreement between Rebuilding Together Nashville and Metro Government for the provision of the rehabilitation of affordable housing units. Councilman Sledge is the sponsor. Uh, is there a motion? Motion made and seconded. Seeing no one in the queue, all in favor of 726, please say aye. 
726 is recommended to the council. Resolution 2017-2727 approves an amendment to a grant from the State Department of Labor and Workforce Development to the Nashville Career Advancement Center to establish programs and services for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Council Lady Gilmore is the sponsor. Uh, is there a motion? Motion, motion made and seconded. Uh, all in favor of 727, please say aye. 727 is recommended to the council. Resolution 2017-728 approves an amendment to a grant from the State Department of Labor and Workforce Development to the Nashville Career Advancement Center to establish career services for eligible adults, youth, and dislocated workers with barriers to employment, education, training, and support services to succeed in the labor market. Council Lady Murphy is our sponsor. Motion made and seconded. All in favor of 728, please say aye. 728 is recommended to the council. Resolution 2017-729 approves an amendment to a grant from the State Department of Labor and Workforce Development to the Nashville Career Advancement Center to establish programs to prepare adult service recipients for employment. Council Lady Murphy is our sponsor. Is there a motion? Motion made and seconded. Um, all in favor of 729, please say aye. 729 is recommended to the council. Resolution RS 2017 730 authorizes the director of public property to purchase property for the use and the benefit of Metro Nashville Public Schools. Councilman O'Connell is the sponsor. Um, is there a motion? Motion made and seconded. <clears throat> now there's a proposed amendment. Actually, there was a typo in the original uh, resolution. Um, and we have a motion to adopt the proposed amendment. Motion made and seconded. Um, Council Lady Allen. Thank you. Does the amendment have to do with the acreage of the property? Yes. Very good. Okay. So it's 0.5 acres? Okay, that makes a lot yeah. more sense. Though the 0.5 is still at a million six hundred thousand dollar per acre price, so yes. But that's you, infinitely better than 0.05 acres. <laughs> Thank you. An engineer, yes, indeed. Um, so we, um, so all in favor of the proposed amendment to 730, please say aye. Aye. Uh, the amendment to 730 passes. Do we need to pass 730? Amended. And then to approve as amended, all in favor. Of 7:30, please say aye. aye. It is 7:30 is recommended to the council. Approves an option agreement between the Metropolitan Government and Hope Church, Hope Park Church, to purchase property owned by Hope Park Church. Um, council Lady Allen and Hurt are sponsors. Um, 7:31. Is there a motion? So motion made and seconded. Councilman Mendez. I just wanted to ask with, about the uh, information about any appraisal that's been done and how the purchase price compares to the appraised value. We have our property director. Yes, the, uh, the purchase price is verified by uh, recent appraisal. Can I have some numbers, please? Um, Per the appraisal was at nine million three. The purchase price at ten million two, which falls within the ten percent range. That's uh, that's it is is part of our guidelines. I guess I'm I'm sorry I missed that. What, what was the appraised value? Nine million three. And the purchase price is ten million two. Okay. Uh, and that uh, that variance is within the ten percent. Uh, correct. That's a policy Metro has. Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, seeing no other speakers in the queue, uh, all in favor of 731, please say aye. aye. 731 is recommended to the council. Resolution 2017-732 approves a grant from the State Department of Environment and Conservation to the Metro Nashville Public Works Department to conduct a waste and recycling characterization study. Councilman Elrod is the sponsor. Um, is there a motion? Motion made and seconded, and Council Lady Henderson. Thank you, Chair Cooper. Um, not recalling my bill numbers, is this the matter that has been before us in public works? 
committee or is this a separate as it related to the master plan for recycling? No, unrelated. Um, can someone speak to how this grant works in tandem with the proposal for the other $500,000 master plan and why they're both needed or? We have Thank a you. representative from Ms. Smith from Public Works. Master plan is putting together this long-term plan to help us um, move Nashville and Davidson County towards zero waste. One thing that we're trying to do in addition to that that will provide information for the plan is a two-season comprehensive waste characterization. And I know that sounds like, um, you know, you just go out there and say, yeah, we have a lot of this or that. But it's actually a sort of a scientific process where they take um, samples of the waste that all sectors uh, residential, commercial, uh, institutional are throwing out, and they go through that and determine sort of how we, how the composition of our waste looks. And that can help to make a determination of the types of processes we will want to use going forward to reduce waste. So, for example, uh, the city of Austin, in doing their waste characterization, realized that they have a lot more than the national average of food waste that's being disposed of. So they decided to put more effort into food waste reduction than they might have without knowing that. So one reason why we want to do this uh, is because we want to make sure, as we put together that plan and as we look long term, we're making the right decisions. Okay, and I appreciate that. I, I think this especially since it's grant funded, <laughs> seems to be uh, money well spent. But can you speak to, I guess I was under the impression that the recycling master plan, the $500,000 that are proposed there included the waste characterization study. And I guess that was a misunderstanding on my part. Yes. But can you speak to, I just guess comparatively, what's in that master plan for 500K if it does not include a waste characterization study? Yes. What okay. that plan is doing is it's looking at um, quite a number of things. It's looking at what other c cities have successfully done to reduce waste. It's looking at all of the different types of options that we might use here in Nashville. So food waste diversion. It's looking at things like um, uh, anaerobic digestion, waste to energy. It's going to look at all of the different options that are out there for disposal, even landfilling, and put together what would get us th from where we are today to 30 years into the future to reduce waste. It's also going to look at things that other cities have done, like franchise agreements and pay-as-you-throw, where you have variable rates, you start treating waste like a utility instead of just treating it like we do now where it's sort of buried in your property taxes and nobody knows what, what it does. We're also going to be doing a triple bottom line analysis so that when we come back, we know what the cost is uh, long term for those, you know, those sort of top options. It's going to involve public input. It will involve interviews of um, uh, council members like the members of the uh, Public Works Committee. It is basically uh, patterned after what a lot of other cities have done. In the uh, scope that we had, we wanted to include a waste characterization study, but they're, they're quite expensive. And uh, while we were working on the scope, TDEC approached me and said they would be willing to fund it. So we went ahead and put it into the uh, proposal, and uh, we were actually wanting a waste characterization. They came back and said they wanted to do a waste and recycling characterization, so they also wanted to do an analysis of what is going in our recycling stream, and they would fund both, so I was not going to turn them down. No, that, that really does seem excellent. I was just wanting to understand how it dovetails with yes. uh, the master plan. Yeah, so they both benefit each other. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Um, Seeing no one else in the queue, all in favor of 732, please say aye. aye. 732 is recommended to the council. Resolution 2017-737 authorizes the Metro Department of Law to compromise and settle the medical malpractice claim of Valda Banks as administratrix ad litem of the estate of Thomas Bowers against the Metro Hospital Authority in the amount of $250,000. Is there a motion? Motion made and... Seconded and Councilman Pulley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Got a couple. Of, is there somebody that can speak to this? I, would it be the hospital authority or board of long, long term care for facility representative? 
I guess it's left to you, Mr. Cooper. Uh, Mr. Well, uh, we have a representative from the hospital authority, too. Thank you. Mark, Mark Overlock, General Counsel for the Hospital Authority. Okay, thank you, James Mr. Robinson Overlock. With, I just uh, had a Metro legal. Okay, and got somebody with you there? Yes, my defense counsel. Good, good. <laughs> You're going to need it. <laughs> uh, uh, I have a couple of questions for you. It looks like, uh, based on the facts here, there was a stand in order for blood chemistry. I understand this is maybe six or six or so years ago, and hopefully things have uh, changed around there, but uh, it appears as though those orders were not followed. Uh, so can you speak to that issue for me? That's correct. Uh, we took a good long look at this case, tried to mediate it, and uh, as you know, for a nursing home, the standard of care is nursing care, as opposed to a general hospital where it's the physician-driven care. So this was a um, sort of bad case, and... Um, so the bad case is negligence on the part of a physician and a nurse assistant, is that right? S nursing. So nursing. the order was laid down by the doctor and the nursing staff, to the extent they may have done what they should have, we never, they never documented it. So at trial, we would have very, uh, a high bar to prove that we weren't negligent. You have a high bar to prove that. Uh, are you stating that the negligence was on the part of the employee or you have a policy issue regarding how your medical records are kept? So with, <laughs> I don't know, James, you wanna? Oh, sure. Um, in the records, there's no proof that this test was performed and the standard of care required that the test be performed as ordered by the doctor. And there's just no evidence that that test was performed. And so if this matter made it to trial, uh, the plaintiff would be able to show that the standard of care was not met, and so the hospital authority would be found negligent uh, for the failure to perform the test that was ordered by the doctor. So you're not necessarily admitting that there's negligence on the part of the employee, but uh, the standard of care was not met because there aren't medical records to prove that uh, those chem tests were performed. Is that what you're stating? Uh, that's correct, and if uh, sort of uh, a... Uh, rule of thumb in medical malpractice cases, if you can't doc if it wasn't documented, it didn't happen. And okay. so Have you done anything to correct that so that it would be documented in the future from a policy perspective? So at the time, uh, we, any case that comes along like this, we had a full quality review and um, got, would have gotten more robust, but of course we've not had the Bordeaux uh, facility under the hospital authority's purview for at least almost three years now. So I'm speaking to the wrong person then, if I want to talk about the current facility. Which, of course, Metro doesn't run anymore. Right, gotcha, you know, although we do supplement. So uh, just to, to your point, uh, Councilman Pulley, we do learn from those cases and um, also are able to translate the wisdom to general hospital in terms of policy dictates. Okay, uh, one question for uh, finance or Mr. Cooper. Uh, this is a uh, settlement that's coming out of the general fund and not what we supplement the hospital authority with, is that correct? Correct, this is in addition to the uh, subsidy in the operating budget. And it's your opinion that we'd be facing uh, substantially more liability if we were to take this court to, this to trial? Yes, in my opinion, this would be a cap case, meaning it would be $300,000 plus the expert costs associated with going through trial. So I think the settlement is in Metro's best interest. Okay, thank you. I have no further. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilor Wiener. I just have a question for Mark. Can you share those chem tests were they to have been farmed out to an outside vendor, or were they to have been done within the facility? So oh, they were to be done within the facility by the facility's phlebotomist and for, by the nursing staff. And so th this was a responsibility of the uh, facility. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Uh, seeing no one else in the queue, all in favor of 737, please say aye. aye. Um, um, Councilman Pulley, are you anticipating the next case? Or okay, <laughs> please say aye. <laughs> seven three seven is uh, uh, recommended to the committee. RS twenty seventeen seven three eight authorized the Metro Department of Law to compromise and settle the property damage claim of George Brandt against Metro in the amount of thirty thousand six eighteen eighty one. Uh, is there a motion? Motion made and seconded. And then Councilman Pulley. 
Can we get somebody from water here to speak to this? Good afternoon, John Honeysucker, Metro Water. Thank you, Mr. Honeysucker. So it looks like we have a water employee. Somebody called, said they wanted the water turned on, and then they called back and said they, they wanted it left off. Is that correct? That is correct. And it was turned on and not... The first order was followed and the second one was not. Is that, that correct? That is correct. All right. Now, can you speak to whether or not this is negligence on the part of the employee or if you have a particular policy issue that allows this to happen? And if so, has that policy issue been remedied? Okay. Typically, we do have an, we do, actually, we do have a policy that if a meter is turned on and any form of movement that takes place with someone not being there, the policy is not to turn it on because that would indicate there is some form of leak within the household. This particular employee was a new employee still under probationary, under his probationary period at that time, who's no longer with us. He chose to resign uh, after this particular incident, but he did not follow the policy. And being a new employee, wouldn't you have a manager that would supervise him to ensure that these procedures were met? In most cases, there is a there is a supervisor that coaches are trained. There is an extensive training program that they go through. But this particular uh, employee did not follow the rule that was set forth. That, and it's pretty standard. If a meter shows any type of movement, period, you do not turn on. If if someone's there, if someone is not at home, at the uh, location that you're turning it on. So this being vacant property, the water was turned on, left on. And as a result, there was significant damage done to the property. And uh, is, that's what we're settling for is the amount of money uh, calculated for the damages in that alone. Is that right, Mr. That, Cooper? That's correct. Okay. All right. And uh, the employee decided to resign? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. I have nothing further. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilor Lady Vircher. Uh, yes, Mr. Honeysucker mentioned in most cases. What cases is this not the case? Well, that's standard. Uh, it would that would be a standard. If there, if a meter, if someone's not at home when a meter request has been put in, we would not turn the we would not uh, administer turning the water on. Period. And this employee was not supervised. At that time, no, ma'am. Why? If he was in a probationary period? A lot of times in a probationary period, they don't always, uh, are not always supervised. They go through extensive training, and from that point, they're allowed to go out to perform the duties. Define extensive training. Uh, I don't want to get into specifics on that because I don't know the exact training in that particular area, but I can find out exactly what the training is for media readers and anyone that is instructed to turn on. Where was the employee at in his probationary period? At what month? Yes. I'd have to find that out for you. How long is the probationary period? Usually it's uh, six or nine months. Six to nine months. So we don't know if he was 30 days in, 60 days in, or 90 days in? That is correct. I, I will check on that information for you. What's the policy for that as it relates to the training and when an employee is in a probationary period to when we send them out on property by themselves? Uh, that's, a, that's a question. I'd have to check with our HR person, and I can... Uh, have that information to you tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Council Lady. Um, seeing no one else in the queue, all in favor of 738, please say aye. aye. 738 is recommended to the Council. Uh, resolution 2017-739 authorizes the Metro Department of Law to compromise and settle the medical malpractice claim of Jacqueline Hoskins as administrator ad litem of the estate of Everett W. Vest, the third deceased against the Metro Hospital Authority in the amount of $180,000. Is there a motion? Motion made and seconded. And Councilman Pulley. Mark. Hopefully this won't be an exercise in futility again, but I guess the same thing, uh, my, my same questions apply. It just looks like uh, uh, this is the scary part about sending any of your relative to a long-term care facility. Right here we have a guy that's supposed to be turned every two hours, quadriplegic. Uh, and that was the orders, uh, and it appears as though, uh, according to my information, it was turned every eight hours. Is that what the record shows? I believe that that is the, what the record shows. The record uh, reflects yeah. that one time a shift he was turned when he was supposed to be turned every two hours. So at Bordeaux, when I used to be there, we 
the facility actually played a jingle every two hours because lots of patients had to be turned every two hours. And part of the problem in this case is that we didn't necessarily document the fact that we may have been turning the, the patient. In these wounds, these decubitus ulcers, there's a real science to treating them and also staging them. So we got the patient from Vanderbilt with a stage one, but you never know, in fact, if it's actually a stage one or if it could be the next day, it could be a stage four. So that was part of the problem. Um, okay, so the presiding physician and the hospital authority were sued and we are settling this for 180. What's our exposure, Mr. Cooper? 300,000 would be the, the cap plus whatever costs for um, experts and, and other litigation costs. And based on your opinion, uh, this we'd lose if we went to trial uh, based on the facts, is that? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, based on what I can read. And uh, we do we have anybody that can speak to the changes that have made been made to prevent these kinds of things from happening again? Because Pierce is owed to me, it's another uh, uh, medical records issue and could potentially be a quality of care issue as well. So, uh, just like the prior case, uh, we did translate that knowledge to general hospital and we make sure, because that's one of the, the key strategies at the hospital, make sure you have the right bed, right support, uh, turn the patient, make sure you stage the, the wound correctly and apply the, the correct treatment as quickly and aggressively as possible. Thank you, I appreciate it very much. I have nothing further. Thank you, Councilman. Seeing no one else in the queue, all in favor of 739, please say aye. 739 is recommended to the committee. Resolution RS 2017-740 authorizes the Metro Department of Law to compromise and settle the claims of William James McGilmer against Officer Desmond Hughes in the amount of $11,500. Is there a motion? Motion made and seconded, and Councilman Pulley. Good afternoon. Sorry. Captain Hager, thanks for coming before us. I know it's not a whole lot of money, but I do want to talk to you a little bit about the facts of the case here. Can you uh, walk us through the, uh, the situation and the facts? Uh, essentially, an officer has responded to a man who was alleged to have committed an aggravated assault with a firearm, and they encountered that subject refusing to exit the doorway and in an attempt to use less than lethal force, deployed a taser, and as a result, the man fell. All right, it appears as though there are some facts that are in dispute. Uh, I guess the uh, plaintiff in this suit is saying that he obeyed the police commands and had his hands up, uh, but uh, there's no evidence to support that. Is that accurate? No, sir. All right, um, Mr. Cooper, uh, is there any factual basis that can be supported uh, uh, to show that the police department did any wrongdoing in this case? No, the, uh, all of the officers were found to have followed policy. Um, the, the suspect did exactly match the specific description of the suspect in the, um, the 911 call. Um, the, the, the use of the taser under departmental policy was appropriate um, in, in that instance. This is being submitted essentially as a business decision. Um, right now, the police officer is subject to personal liability. Juries are unpredictable, and while we think that if it did go to court, um, a jury would, would find in favor of the officer, um, settling it for this low amount is cheaper than it would cost us to actually go to trial. So in addition to being the business decision of settling it because uh, from the calculations, it probably would cost you significantly more in this to defend, in addition, you alleviate the liability to the individual police officers, is that correct? Correct. All right, and uh, the plaintiff alleges that he had his hands up, but there's no evidence to support that statement, is that correct? My recollection from reviewing the, the facts is that the, um, the police reports do not indicate that the suspect had his hands up, it was that he um, refuse to obey the officer's commands to exit the, the doorway. So there's really nothing here that it, their policy covers uh, exactly what they did and, and um, there's no policy issues that need to be addressed here and no actions on the police officer 
on the part of the police officer that really need to be addressed. This is simply a business decision and nothing more. Correct. I mean, there, the, um, the court did find that there was a, a factual dispute as to whether the use of force was appropriate. So if that went to the jury, it would be up to the jury to decide that. Um, the, based upon the departmental policy, everything was, was handled the way it was supposed to be handled. Um, so again, this is being submitted as a primarily a business decision. Right, and a factual dispute is just that, a dispute between both sides over what is factually accurate. Is that a correct analogy of that? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much, I appreciate it. Thank you, Councilman. Um, seeing no one else in the queue, all in favor of 740, please say aye. aye. 740 is recommended to the Council. Bills on second reading, bill number BL 2017-705, uh, Councilman Shulman and Blaylock sponsors, establishes an incentive program to allow neighborhoods to be awarded for meeting all code requirements. Is there a motion? Motion made and seconded. Uh, um, Councilman Mendez, our first speaker. I guess I was going to ask Councilman Shulman to talk more about this. I know there were some questions last time it was up. Councilman Shulman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Councilman Mendez. Um, actually, I was going to ask for a motion to defer. This is uh, the neighborhood incentive cleanup bill that um, there's a wish list item on. Um, uh, what it's designed to do is to, to um, work with the codes department to come up with an incentive program to help clean up neighborhoods. Uh, if neighborhoods got together and figured out that they had codes problems, they call codes in, they come take a look. Neighborhood gets together, tries to work together to clean it up. If codes comes back in, the neighborhood is free of codes violations. There's some incentive involved with it. Um, at this point, it's not funded, uh, and so the purpose of asking for a deferral until uh, July the 6th uh, is to get it behind the budget to see if anybody is interested in doing this and then put money into it. Um, the way the, the, the language is written now, it, um, I, I don't want to move it yet, just in case somebody wants to amend it, maybe make it into a pilot program or put some more stipulations on, but basically that's what the, that's what the bill is designed to do. Okay. Thank you, Councilman. Um, Councilman Mendez, and then um, I believe Councilman Bednay, hearing is Mary Carolyn Roberts. I like to keep you, you know, like this, moving around. I'm, I'm interested in this legislation. Uh, some of you may know that I'm uh, an advocate for participatory budgeting, uh, PV, and that's a way to empower residents to uh, get a more direct involvement in uh, how the city's budget is spent. So I'm, I will be curious to uh, work with you, Councilman, and see if we can uh, find a way to make this into an opportunity for residents to uh, have an impact in how their money gets spent in a more direct way. So thanks for bringing this up. Thank you, Councilman. And so this continues to be a wish list item, and your motion is to, however, to defer this bill to uh, July the 6th. That would, Mr. Chairman, that would be my uh, preference. Uh, obviously, I'm not on the committee, but um, yeah, the idea is um, comes up as a wish list item, wish list item if um, council members are interested, if they're interested in coming up with um, some part of this program, a pilot program, or if they want to fully fund it, if the actual cost is, uh, if every district got $25,000, all 35 districts, I think it's $875,000. Um, but there may need to be some work on the bill, wish list item, in order to kind of get it behind the budget to see if it gets any funding. The idea is to move it to July 6th. Thank you. Uh, Council Lady Henderson. Thank you, Chair Cooper. Um, I, I wanted to make a suggestion, if I could, that we uh, think about maybe using a preferred nonprofit partner like the Neighborhoods Resource Center, um, just since CODES is already so taxed, their sort of ability to administer a program like this, I think, would be... Um, in question and, and maybe the funding would have somebody to administer it. But I think it's a great idea and I applaud Councilman Shulman, but I don't know if there's a potential to have, you know, a preferred or demonstrated nonprofit partner that's focused on all of Nashville's neighborhoods, maybe helping to administer it and be the conduit through which, because I know there's um, 
some challenges often. Having led neighborhood associations, they are not often or rarely are 501c3s that could receive this sort of funding and how they would appropriately receive that money and disperse it, I think is somewhat in question. So I support the concept for sure, and I, I just wanted to make that suggestion. Thank you. Council Lady, back to our sponsor. Uh, any ideas, um, Mr. Chairman, any ideas are welcome. I think um, we keep working on this to see if we have something. Um, thank you, Councilman. Um, the motion having been made to def defer it to the July the 6th meeting and seconded. All in favor of deferring to July the 6th, please say aye. Uh, 7 of 5 is deferred to the July the 6th meeting. Um, BL 2017-707 amends the Metro Code with respect to procurement of telecommunications and internet access services. <coughs> Council Lady Murphy, myself as sponsors, I believe there's a request to defer this, to withdraw this. Uh, in this case, so moved and seconded. All in favor of withdrawing? Please say aye. 707 is withdrawn. <laughs> BL 2017-723 establishes the tax levy in the General Services District for the fiscal year 2017-2018 and declares the amount required for the annual operating budget of the Urban Services District. Uh, there is a substitute uh, in your package. Uh, is there a, a motion to move the substitute? Moved and seconded. Uh, is there a discussion? Uh, seeing none, all in favor of the substitute to 723, please say aye. The substitute of 723 is recommended to the council. 2017-724 uh, establishes a program. Oh, approved as substituted. Approved as substituted and then approved as substituted. Is and there then a motion to approve? Lady Allen. Just for the record, can we can we state that the, uh, the substitute didn't change the amount of the 3.115 that we were expecting it to be? Okay, that was a definite nod. Thank you. I just I just want that to be on the record for anybody that's watching. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Um, BL 2017-724 establishes a program for the purpose of providing assistance to low-income elderly residents of the Metropolitan Government for the fiscal years 2017-2018. Council Lady Vircher is the sponsor. Um, is there a motion? Motion made and seconded. Uh, Councilman Mendez. Um, if somebody could just uh, help me understand. So this is a program that has existed, will continue to exist, and this is just establishing the funding amount for the next year? Is that right? Correct. Correct. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Seeing no one else in the queue, all in favor of 724, please say aye. Aye. 724 is recommended to the Council. BL 2017-725 establishes a conservation assistance grant fund to facilitate conservation and preservation of properties with great natural, cultural, and environmental importance. Council Lady Henderson is the sponsor. Is there a motion? Motion made and seconded. All in favor of 725, seeing no one in the queue, please say aye. Uh, 725 is recommended to the council. Bill BL 2017-76 amends the Metro Code to add a requirement for the Department of Finance to maintain a written debt management policy. Councilman Mendez, Swope, and others as the sponsors. Is there a motion? Motion made and seconded. And Councilman Mendez. Um, I, I think, uh, given the fact that this meeting has uh, gone on a while, I think I'm going to, uh, with a brief explanation, move to defer this um, one meeting uh, to the June 20th meeting. And um, the explanation is, I, I, so I met last week with uh, uh, Talia and her staff to talk about this, and um, there's, uh, um, and, and for background, Metro has a debt management policy. Um, it doesn't exactly mirror um, the state's model policy. Metro's is approved um, by the state, um, and the purpose of this ordinance is to um, get more things added in to, to augment the existing policy. It's been, I think, since 2011, since uh, Metro's was updated. And the conversation I had with finance um, was a good one, um, but there are some things that, that need to, to be addressed that hopefully I can do in the form of an amendment uh, for the next meeting. The uh, one thing that would be an action item for finance that we talked about was to um, try to pull out of this ordinance references to um, OPEB and pension obligations 
and uh, what we talked about um, possibly doing is to help with that, to have finance uh, provide the committee um, with a summary of what the current um, OPEB and pension liability is um, and the level of funding status, both for Metro and the school system. And that information um, is available in um, our annual audits, um, but, but Metro or the finance, um, I think will be willing to get us a summary of that information before we um, move forward with the next meeting. Did I, did I get that about right, finance director? <laughs> All right, thank you. So with that, um, you know, renew the motion to defer this for one meeting to June 20th. Move to defer one meeting till June 20th. All in favor of the deferral motion, please say aye. 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 Uh, 726 is deferred to the June 20th meeting. Bill 2017-727 amends the Metro Code concerning the display of taxicab permits. Is there a motion? Motion made and seconded. Um, seeing no one in the queue, all in favor of 727, please say aye. 727 is... Uh, um, recommended to the council, 2017-729 approves an amendment to an agreement between the Metropolitan Government and Piedmont Natural Gas. Um, is there a motion? Motion made and seconded. Councilman Mendez, did you wish to address 729? Yeah, yeah, briefly, if some, I, I think this is a. Uh, um, a uh, basically a property swap for an amount that's owed, and I wanted to get more information about the appraised value compared to the amount owed. Maybe I maybe I'm not remembering that right exactly. I, I think this one has to do with the um, when the ballpark was built. There was a gas line running through the um, ballpark property that was uh, discovered. The council approved an agreement to swap a portion of property where we had the mulch facility uh, in exchange for that, uh, where that gas line was located. The council approved that a couple years ago. All this does is extend the agreement. Um, it took a little longer to dispose of the mulch than was originally contemplated. And so this just, um, the mulch is all gone now. It was supposed to be gone by um, the end of the month. Um, so this just, uh, extends the the closing date for that. Uh, okay, now I'm remembering. So it do, uh, this extends the date. It doesn't change any of the financial obligations, except if Metro doesn't um, get the relocation done by July 31, then there's some additional financial obligations. Right. right. And and we have removed all of the material. The only thing that's left there is a um, I think it's a small outbuilding that um, Piedmont may end up uh, wanting left on the property. Um, so I think that's er everything else is gone in accordance with the agreement. All right, thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Um, seeing no one else in the queue, all in favor of 729, please say aye. 729 is recommended to the Council. Bill 2017-730 authorizes the Metro Department of Water and Sewerage Services to fund the operation and maintenance of a public pressure sewer extension for its development at Clover Glen. Uh, is there a motion? Motion made and seconded. Seeing no one else in the queue. All in favor of 730, please say aye. Aye, 730 is recommended to the council. Bill 2017-731 authorizes the acquisition of certain right-of-way easements, drainage easements, temporary construction easements, and property rights for use in public projects for the purposes of the Lone Oak Road sidewalk improvements. Councilman Pulley is our sponsor. Um, is there a motion? Motion made and seconded. Seeing no one in the queue, all in favor of 731, please say aye. 731 is recommended to the council. Um, bill number 2017-735 creates various positions of the Metropolitan Government. I will not read them all unless I'm required. Am I required? No. That you've read the summary caption. I've read the summary caption. Um, Council Lady Murphy is the sponsor. Uh, is there a motion? Motion made and seconded. Um, seeing no one in the queue, all in favor of 735, please say aye. 735 is recommended to the Council. Um, let me check, are there any late items? 
Seeing no late items, this was an agenda. Of, oh, Council Lady Vircher, yes. Thank you, Chair. Before uh, we adjourn, I would like for us to, to wish our beloved, most gracious Director of Finance, happy birthday. Oh. Today's her birthday. Very good. <laughs> all right, wonderful. Thank you, I'm Council Lady. Um, uh, thank you all. A 41 uh, item agenda. Thank you for your patience. This committee stands adjourned until Thursday at 4 o'clock, where we continue our but work session. Thank you very much.